Hello there, I'm Lee Ashton of The Sales Consultancy and I'd like to thank you for taking the time out to watch this DVD, The Seven Biggest Mistakes Your Sales Team Could Be Making That Cost You Sales. I know it's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? I have managed salespeople for over 20 years and like you, I have experienced the joys of managing a sales team and I'm sure we have both experienced the pain of managing a sales team. What I love about sales is it's such an exciting and vibrant and energetic sector to work in. Uh, it's challenging, there's variety, there's the personal interaction, the yes when you get that sale is just phenomenal. I don't think you can beat it, I absolutely love it. There's also a pain, and that's especially when you're managing a team. It's the pain of watching others struggle to close those sales. It's the frustration when you watch your salespeople and know they are capable of so much more, and you're not quite sure what key will unlock the door to the particular barrier that's stopping them from being amazing and outstanding salespeople? And I know that can be really frustrating because I've been there. What I want to do is to share my experiences with you and give you some pointers that help you identify the biggest mistakes that could impact on their sales, give you some pointers on how to fix those areas of concern, those issues, and really how to boost that motivation and the sales results that your team get. Now, you might be wondering right now why you should even listen to me. So let me just quickly tell you a little bit about me. I've been in sales for 28 years and many moons ago as a young sales manager I became increasingly frustrated by the inconsistent performance of my sales team. Now this really made me curious and really motivated me to go and find out how come some people just close sales really easily and some of them struggle. What I found was that what goes on inside a person's head has the biggest impact on whether they're going to be successful in sales or not. And for the last 15, 16 years, I've been training literally thousands of salespeople to incorporate psychology to make positive changes into their attitude, their approach, and their sales results. And what I'm sharing with you today is the culmination of my research over those years and what I've found when working with salespeople. So shall we get on and explore these seven biggest mistakes? Let's get cracking. Mistake number one is that salespeople can often allow themselves to drift into the valley of reasons and excuses. Now, what do I mean by that? There are two approaches a salesperson can take in their role in your organisation. The first way they can react is to be in effect. What I mean by that is that they allow external events, situations or people to impact on them in a negative way. They will say things like, it's the economy, budgets are frozen, people are not spending money. They'll come up with lots of reasons and excuses that kind of let them off the hook for performance that isn't maybe the best it can be. The other approach that the more successful salespeople adopt 
is to be at cause. Now to be at cause is not to deny that those things are happening out there, but it actually is okay. So if all that's going on, what can I do to maintain control and come up with solutions that still get me my targets, my objectives? What are the things that I can do? So in order for you to spot the ones that are allowing themselves to drift into the valley of reasons and excuses, you'll need to listen to the language that they use. When they're talking about their pipeline or their lack of sales, they will blame something or someone else. It's just not their fault. You'll notice that there's an avoidance to certain things because deep down, they think there's little point in giving 100% because it's just so tough out there anyway. Now, they might not consciously be thinking that. It will be something deep down that they're not even aware they're thinking themselves. But you'll be able to spot it in the language that they use and noticing the behaviours of reluctance. So what can you do when you have a salesperson that is in effect you need to put them back at cause. And how you do that is with this very simple question. Okay, so if all that's true, what action are you going to take to still achieve your objectives? At this point, you need to stay silent. Now, I'm sure that you have an answer that you could give them. I'm sure you've got ideas that actually would get them on track and you really must resist giving them. What you need to do now is allow the salesperson to come up with their own solutions. And even if they're a little bit off track, let them do it. You need to let them scuff their knees in order to develop winning strategies. So get them back at cause, get them to come up with the actions and monitor the actions so that you can make sure they stay on track. And if, they, if they're avoiding the actions, then find ways of getting them back on track by coming up with their own solutions. Now, what this will give you is a salesperson that thinks for themselves. They come up with their own solutions. And through this, they're more empowered, they're more confident, they close more sales. So give them the opportunity to come up with their own solution, once you've noticed that they've drifted into that valley. Good luck with that one. Mistake number two is not dealing with limiting beliefs. Henry Ford said, if you believe you can or believe you can't, you're probably right. Now it's my favourite quote and it really explains the impact when somebody has a limiting belief. Now beliefs are just feelings, they're feelings of certainty. And when a salesperson has a limiting belief, they are certain that they can't do something specific. You'll spot this in the language that they use. They'll come up with, I can't do that. I can't present to groups. I'm okay with individuals. It will be that kind of thing. You'll also notice that they avoid doing things because deep down, they actually have this belief that they can't do it. And the scary bit is that they may not even be aware of the belief. 95% of what we do as human beings is unconscious behavior. So as their sales leader, their sales director or sales manager, it's really down to you to spot those avoidance strategies, to spot the language they use and deal with them straight away. Because if you allow them to continue with those beliefs, you're actually creating a scenario that is self-fulfilling because they will truly believe that they can't do it so they avoid it and when they do it they don't put 100% into it and it may not go very well 
So that reinforces the belief. So what can you do? Your role is really to help them identify for themselves that there's an issue. I ask the question, what stops you? And from that, normally I get reasons and excuses and limiting beliefs. And the best thing you can do is to help them to come up with counter examples where the opposite is true. Because there will be situations where they have done magnificently at those very things they believe they can't. But their unconscious mind stores them, their conscious mind ignores them and forgets them. So if you can help salespeople to identify and destabilize those limiting beliefs, then what you get is a salesperson that's more empowered, more confident, more able to step outside of their comfort zone and try new things, and of course, more sales. Mistake number three is focusing on their own objectives, focusing on their own map of the world. Now, let me explain that concept a little bit. My map of the world has been created from the moment I was born to this very day, all the situations, the people who have influenced me, who I have experienced in my life, have shaped who I am and the way I perceive the world. No one else is likely to have had exactly the same experience, which means that every individual has their own map of the world and their own way of perceiving the world and the people within it. Now, the mistake that very often happens in sales teams, and I have experienced this so much when I go into organisations, is that the salesperson is focusing on their own objectives and not really giving enough weight to the map of the world of the client or prospect that they're interacting with. Now, the way in which you can determine whether a salesperson is focusing on their own objectives and their own map is in the language that they use when they're with clients and prospects and in the emails that they write to their clients and prospects. The language will be what I call very we focused. We do this, we offer that, our organisation is great at this and they may actually be talking about benefits but they'll be using we language. The way in which you'll get more engagement is when the salesperson leaves their map and goes into the map of the other person and asks really relevant questions like, tell me about your problems and challenges. Tell me about your objectives. What are the barriers to achieving those objectives? How long have you been trying to get this outcome? How committed are you to getting this outcome? As soon as you know the answers to those questions, it's really easy for the salesperson to say, great, you can have this with us. You'll get that with us. You definitely won't have to deal with that anymore. So get the salespeople to develop a really great range of questions that elicit the clients or prospects map of the world so that you can match what you do to what they want. Another giveaway that a salesperson is in their own map is when they're at a meeting or even on the telephone, they pitch what they offer before the client or prospect tells them their scenario, their situation. So if you are able to get the salesperson to leave the we and join the you approach, they'll get less objections because they're less pitching. And they'll also be able to elicit those golden nuggets of information that flourish into additional sales opportunities, the upsells, the cross-sells, the new business opportunities. So they'll become more effective at generating opportunities closing sales because they're listening and matching more 
and they'll become more confident and have more self-belief in their ability. So this is a really important one. So get your salespeople to focus on the you and you will definitely increase your sales results. This leads me very nicely onto the next mistake. Mistake four is asking closed questions. I have a belief that there is absolutely no point in a closed question. They're very much in the map of the person asking the question and the recipient is just saying yes or no. The other drawback of closed questions is that you only have one or two seconds before you need to come up with the next question. And that puts the salesperson under an incredible amount of pressure and means that they're not really listening. As soon as you notice that your salespeople are asking closed questions, it's your duty as a sales manager or director to make them aware of that and ask them how they could ask that in an open way. Now I have my own guidelines when it comes to open questions. Anything that starts with who, what, when, where and how are perfect open questions and the what and how questions are going to give you some really great criteria and processes that the client or prospect uses in their decision making process. So they are especially useful. I just want to touch on an open question that many years ago I used to ask before I discovered the psychology behind selling and that is the why question. Why didn't we get the business? Why are you going for this? Why are you going for that? And what I want to point out is that why questions are really confrontational. Every time you ask a client or prospect a why question, you're asking for justification of their previous response and this pushes them into a corner. What you will get is an emotional response. So if you spot your salespeople asking why questions, get them to change it to a what question. If it's to do with a, a contract or deal that you didn't get, then I would always ask, what is it about our offer that makes it less than perfect? Or what is it about the company that you've chosen that makes them a better fit for you? Because that way you will get the criteria of their decision rather than the emotional response that a why question often creates. So the benefits to you if your team are asking more open questions is more elicitation of crucial information better sales actually, because if they're eliciting more information, then the sales that they match to the client or prospect are a much better fit. So there's less fallout or callback. And again, more confidence and more sales. Mistake number five is not having an outcome for every interaction. It's really important to have an outcome that's achievable and, and really measurable. Now, every salesperson will go into a meeting, for example, and want to close a sale. But for me, that is the big picture outcome, but there needs to be some stepping stones along the way. They need to go in with a set of objectives that actually means that the first level of interaction is going to be much more about starting the relationship or developing the relationship and moving it on rather than let's close the sale because that puts them in their own space, their own map and stops them developing great levels of rapport. 
the things that you need to watch out for is language that they use. You know, I worked with a client recently who said that they went along to meetings and said, let's see what happens. And they used to go along in pairs and meet at the client's premises. And what they found after they learned about the psychology of, of setting outcomes is that if they met half an hour before the meeting, worked out what they wanted to achieve in the meeting, then the meeting was more successful and it transformed their conversion rate. So where, as a manager of salespeople, it's really important that you notice and ask constantly, what's your outcome for this call? What's your outcome for this meeting? What's your outcome for this presentation? So that they have in the forefront of their mind what they really want to achieve. You'll notice that people who have very general outcomes will go virtually through the motions. They will use the same process for every client. It won't be tailored. So start to get them to do that. And you can do that very easily by asking the questions before a meeting and asking after the meeting the way in which it went against their outcome for that meeting. The benefits, I guess, of doing that and getting more proactive at that is that you'll get salespeople who think more. They'll be more thoughtful about what results they achieve from the actions that they take. They will plan their meetings more effectively and they will tailor their approach to the client or prospect that they're meeting with. Mistake number six is not prioritizing. It's so important that your salespeople are doing the right things and enough of those right things. I often find when I go into sales teams that, well, I guess it's for all of us really, we're drawn to doing the things that we like doing most. And we're all really good at avoiding the things that we like doing least. Now that's great as long as it doesn't have a negative impact on sales. And what you'll notice is there are certain activities that your salespeople avoid that they need to embrace. And you'll notice this by the very fact that they're avoiding them. That's easy to spot, but that some of them will be very ingenious in looking really busy and doing lots of stuff and making the excuse that they haven't got time to do as much of that as they'd like because they've been doing these other things. So start to notice where that happens. Another one that I find quite a lot is people over-research stuff. I call that paralysis by analysis. It's a fantastic avoidance strategy. Research is invaluable. You need to do research in order to put you in a really powerful position when you're interacting with your clients and prospects. But sometimes people go beyond what is required into the realms of avoidance. So start to notice where individuals in your team are doing that. So how do you fix it? One of the things that we use at the sales consultancy and I share with all my clients is the concept of IPA and FBI. What are these? IPA is an acronym and it's income producing activity. We really focus ourselves and our clients on doing as much IPA as they possibly can. It's what generates sales opportunities and it is what comes before the sale. So it's all the relationship building, prospecting, identifying opportunities, creating powerful emails. It's all of that stuff. What happens after the sale is servicing the client 
And whilst it's really important, it's not income producing activity. So the salesperson's role sometimes gets sucked into that and they're spending more time on that than they are on the income producing activity. And your role really is to analyze how they're spending their time and push them towards spending more time on IPA. Now there's always plenty of IPA to do. So how do you prioritize that they're doing the right IPA? And that's FBI, fastest business impact. It's really just a check. There's all this IPA, which one is going to have the biggest impact on my sales? That's what you do first. And sometimes that differs from what their natural tendency is to choose. So make sure that they have an understanding of FBI and IPA so that they're choosing the right behaviours and activities that are going to make it far easier for them to generate the sales success that they and you want. So what you'll get is a more thoughtful salesperson, much more strategic, much better able to create sales opportunities. And there is a caveat here. You really must resist giving them the answer. I know that you know what they could do, but they need to come up with it themselves. So when you ask them what IPA can you do to generate more sales, they need to give you the response. And then that creates much more of a self-fulfilling prophecy, much more drive to achieve those things. So happy FBI and IPA. The final mistake, mistake number seven, is not changing what isn't working. Salespeople can sometimes lack an awareness and a flexibility that causes them to change what they do. I guess you've heard the old adage, if you do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always got. Well, that's true to an extent, but not always. In my 28 years in sales, the last three to four years have been the fastest moving, most rapid changing time in my whole sales career. Things that always worked stopped working. Things that didn't used to work started working. And then they stopped working again. And then they started working again. It's been such a roller coaster, but really exciting time. So, if your salespeople are using the same processes that generated lots of success for them in the past and has and it stopped working, but they're still using it, hoping that it's going to come back, then that's a serious issue because it may come back, but it may not be for a while and it may never come back. The most successful salespeople will be constantly assessing what they are doing and checking whether it gets them closer to their goal or takes them further away. And if they're not getting the result that they want, they just keep changing their approach until they get the result they want. If it doesn't work that way, they'll try another way. And if that doesn't work, they'll try another way. And they will keep trying lots of different things. So start to notice where the people in your team are using exactly the same processes that they were using years ago. Is there a lack of reflection? Do they assess exactly the result and the impact of what they do? And if they don't, it's your role to actually point them in the right direction. It's really important to give your salespeople feedback. And I know that that's normally done via appraisals or one-to-ones. I think it's really important to do it at the time that it needs to be done, rather than waiting. And my particular style is to tell the salesperson what I liked generally that they did, 
then I will give them one area of improvement, even if there were five or ten. I give them the area to focus on that is going to make the biggest difference. If you give a person too many areas of focus of improvement, it will weaken their focus to improve the one that really makes the most difference. So I give them one specific area of improvement and then I close that with something they did, one specific thing that I particularly liked. So start to do more of that whenever you're with them and you notice stuff. It's really great to give good feedback and really easy and it's a little bit more challenging to give feedback that improves people. Remember, you train people how to treat you. If you allow a salesperson to continue a behavior that doesn't get results, you're actually saying, that's okay, you can carry on. So start to do that, start to incorporate, and again, do not give them the answer. Let them come up with their own solutions, and you'll have a more confident team, you'll have a more strategic team, you will also have a team that start to assess their own patterns of behavior, their own actions, and tweaking them themselves. So more confidence, more opportunities, and more sales. So there you have it the sales mistakes that I consistently find when I go into organizations to work with salespeople. They're the ones that come up time and time again. You may well have come across them and noticed them in your own sales team, and you may well have tried different actions in order to resolve those issues, some of which may have been successful, some of which may not. What I found is that in the course of my work with sales teams, that those strategies that have tried to address the issues have very much focused on conventional sales training. And what I know is that conventional sales training focuses on teaching behaviors. And those trainings really don't address the psychological barriers that get in the way of salespeople's success. Our process or the system that we've created takes salespeople through a process that firstly helps them identify their psychological barriers and gives them the tools to eliminate them. Secondly, teaches them how the mind works so they know exactly how to stay focused and motivated. Thirdly, they get the ability to recognize psychological traits in their clients and prospects so they connect with them at a much deeper level and close more sales. And at an even higher level, what they learn creates more success in their lives, which makes them happier generally. And happier salespeople get more sales. I'm known for increasing sales anywhere from 20 to over 100% in individual cases, with ongoing growth even after completion of my programs. In fact, I worked with a client who in the 12 months following completion of the program, their sales went up 67% when their market was actually in decline by 12%. There are so many salespeople out there struggling, I believe unnecessarily. I know that the processes we use, the system that we have developed, helps salespeople eliminate what's holding them back, gives them the tools to achieve great consistent sales long term. We fix what's going on on the inside so that change occurs at a much deeper level, meaning that any new behaviors are sustainable and long-term. Our mission is to give people the ability to sell themselves, their services and products, their ideas in a really powerful and dynamic way 
and in a way that's completely natural for them. I leave salespeople feeling inspired and motivated to take action. And if you want to talk to me about your own specific sales challenges, then please do get in touch. I'd be delighted to spend time talking through with you. Thank you.